Well, hello everybody, and welcome back to the bench again. Um, I'm getting, I was getting prepared for an upcoming uh, repair that I have, and uh, was going to have to do some uh, transistor matching. And I thought maybe this would be a good opportunity to share with you a few notes on uh, testing and matching transistors. At least, kind of some of the things that I do. Um, I'm sure, you know, there's all kinds of very widely uh, varying opinions as to how to test or how to match transistors. Um, if you look online for things like that, there are so many different th methods out there and so many different opinions and all that. Uh, it's really hard to get any kind of good information uh, how to do this. And why would you even want to do this in the first place? Uh, you might ask, some of you may ask. And I thought of this as being a very good example of why you would want to match transistors. Now, for what I'm doing here, okay, and I'm not talking about at work, I'm just talking about my hobby, repairing stereos, you know, vintage stereos and audio equipment and things. Um, I'll show you one of the reasons that I, that I will actually go and go through the bother of matching transistors. Now, Remember, most of these vintage circuits are actually very, very well designed. And in most instances, uh, if a set of transistors are not perfectly matched, you're really not going to see much difference, especially like the output uh, transistors of some of these big amplifiers. The, the way that the circuitry is designed, the gain of the transistor really doesn't matter. Um, a whole lot unless they're very grossly mismatched or if they are different types of transistors you know two different characteristics um, it's really not a big deal but there is a few instances because you know, remember in the old days people didn't have transistor matching you know curve tracers and all these fancy things they couldn't afford them the average bench tech went to their local parts house they purchased a, a replacement transistor and they plugged they soldered it in and everything was good it worked so just understand that that this is not always going to be something you know and, and in my opinion that's that is pretty much the case today um, but there are a few instances where we run into this and we have to match transistors especially with the smaller signal transistors thing ones that are not high powered ones that are actually amplifying a very low signal uh, up to a reasonable enough voltage that you know it can drive the next stage it's you know for gain so in front of you here I have this phono stage out of a amplifier and I want to bring something to your attention here if you look closely all right let me move this over so I don't have the camera stuck in my nose. If you look very closely here, if the camera will focus. Whoop. There. Um, here's all your transistors. There's two here, two here, two here, two here. Uh, and so there's eight transistors on this thing. But if you notice, four of them have these little blue paint dots on them. Now, those, those have a special meaning. That means that these transistors were matched. And the reason they were matched is the, the balance of these transistors is very critical to the, to the circuit that it's being used in. Now, here's the thing. For a mass-produced company, you know, like... Pioneer, Marantz, Sansui, Kenwood, all these guys back then, for them to sit there with a curve tracer and individually match transistors till they got a pair that matched up uh, for each individual receiver that they were building on the production line would be pretty crazy. So what they would do is when they would manufacture large batches of these transistors, they would test them at the time of manufacturing and they would grade them based on their gain. So anytime you look at a data sheet of a transistor, 
it's going to show you a minimum and maximum gain range of that particular transistor type and it can vary pretty widely so what they do is they bin them in other words they, they sort them into bins uh, at least theoretical bins let's say and they assign a color code to that transistor and that color code would represent a very narrow range of HFE or, or forward current gain of the transistor. That way all you had to do was grab two transistors with the same color code dot on them and you could be relatively sure that those transistors are matched to one another or at least somewhat matched to one another. And that's what you're seeing right here. The problem comes when these start to get noisy and start to fail and you want to replace them. Now, there's many different ways to match transistors uh, that people use. And I have three examples on the bench right now that I'm going to kind of show you how, you know, how they're matched. Now, first of all, you can buy these little eight or ten dollar devices here um, and they're like I said they're very inexpensive you can plug your transistor into it kinda like this and turn it on and if I zoom you in a little bit you can see it tells you what the transistor is and it'll give you the the current on the uh, collector it'll show you the VBE which is 681 millivolts it'll show you the forward current gain which is 175 on this one okay it'll show you the current collector to emitter so it does give you a lot of information and to some degree they're actually pretty useful now the next step up from that would be one of these little peak testers and they're pretty neat because they actually have a 12 volt battery in them and they can apply a little bit a little bit higher voltage you can connect the little probe hooks in any orientation on this just like that other tester we were just looking at just like that hit the test button and again it'll give you a report of what it is which pins are, are which elements it'll show you and you can see same it's giving you the same reading as that cheap one and this thing here is expensive these are upwards of fifty to a hundred dollars US shows you the test current VBE and now if you notice VBE on this one does not match I believe what the VBE was on the other one we'll take a look again at that but this one says 0.78 or 780 millivolts and then there's your current your base current and your leakage current now again these little things are okay and they do give you a little bit of an idea what's going on I just have to see what VBE was again on that yeah 679 millivolts so there is a discrepancy how these things read and there's a lot of factors that come into that remember when you're looking at VBE which is the voltage base emitter it it's very critical that you get good connections I mean you're it's such tiny little voltages and currents that any amount of resistance or any little difference will affect your uh, your readings the other thing is what frequencies they're testing it at uh, the voltages they're they're applying to do their test all of those things can affect that so this is not the ultimate way to match transistors even though it will work uh, to a degree it doesn't test the transistor under real-world conditions number one it doesn't put a uh, variable signal on there like a sine wave or some kind of signal 
Uh, the other thing, it will not put any kind of real-world current on it. It's very, very low current test. Uh, there's quite a few things that are lacking. In most instances, this will work, but in some, you might match up a set of transistors with these devices and find out that it still doesn't work properly. Now, a better way to do it, if you can afford it or if you have one, would be to use a curve tracer. And you, you've all seen this probably if you watch my videos very much. I've used it, I, I built this from a kit that I bought online. And I've done several videos, uh, the Verdon Bell Tower, those Macintosh amplifiers. I matched a couple transistors on that to kind of show you. Um, I think a couple of the stereo restoration videos, I may have used it. But anyways, this will test NPN and PNP transistors. It can test power transistors and small transistors. And what a curve tracer does is it applies a set series of stepped uh, currents onto the transistor and then it reads out the output so you if you have a set base current then it will read the output uh, collector emitter current and then by dividing those out you can come up with the actual forward current gain of the transistor at different at different steps which is really important so if you look at this little chart okay this is a just little chart I made up for this particular curve tracer it'll show you that you have two modes you have power transistor mode and small transistor mode and take this with a grain of salt this is not the same as a commercial grade curve tracer those can be many thousands of dollars uh, if you're interested in learning more about them, there's a lot of uh, information out there. Um, one of the more common ones would be the Tektronix 577. Uh, there's other ones. There's tons of them. They don't make them a whole lot right now. There's maybe one or two models out there that are still in production. Uh, all of the really good ones are super duper expensive now because they're in, you know, people want them. Uh, you know, especially people that work on vintage equipment and uh, those ones can actually put very high voltages very high currents and real world conditions onto the transistor to test it very thoroughly some of them even have two different sockets that you can toggle between to be able to compare two transistors all kinds of fancy features that this one does not have this one puts even on the power transistor mode puts a relatively low current onto the transistor to test it. So again, not as good as the high-end multi-thousand dollar ones, but it is better than those little all-in-one testers. Uh, so the way this thing works is any of you who've looked up curve tracers online, you always see that little, this funny looking comb uh, waveform. Looks like a comb that you'd comb your hair with. You know, these they come up and they, they all kind of fork out into different, different amplitudes. These represent your actual base current. And these are preset by the device. In other words, you're not measuring these base currents. These are the base currents that are being applied to the transistor. And then what you'll do is you measure the voltage that each of those base current lines goes to and <clears throat> the voltage of that represents how many how much current the uh, you, you have going through the uh, emitter collector of the transistor so for instance they have a little example here if you look IB which is your base current is 168 microamps. Now how did we get that and what the heck does that mean? Well if you look at this little chart down here the instructions have a chart and I just kind of retyped it to make it easier to understand. When you're in low power setting for small transistors each step starting with the bottom step to the top step there's eight steps. So in other words this one will use eight different currents base currents to test the transistor. The very first one would represent 
no base current. So this is your, your baseline. Step number two in small transistor mode would be 24 microamperes or 24 microamps of current on the base. And then the next one would be 48, 72, 96, 120, 144, and 168 microamps. So now that we know that, those are, those are your constants. And by applying each one of these currents to the base, the transistor will turn on, it will bias, and it will output a certain current. So and it will cause the emitter to collector junction to conduct at a certain current. And the way, that, the way this curve tracer works is it converts that current into a representative voltage amplitude. So in other words, we're set at 20 millivolts per division is how they have it set here. But the scale is one millivolt equals one milliamp of output current. So for each millivolt from the zero line, this hundred, for instance, they're using 168. So if you measure zero up to here, it's 60 millivolts. Okay, because it's 20 millivolts per division, so there's 20, 40, 60 millivolts. If one millivolt equals one milliamp, that means you have 60 milliamps of output current from the transistor. So now we have our two, our two factors. We have, we know from this eighth step that it is 168 microamps at the base from our chart, and we know that we have 60 millivolts, which equals 60 milliamps of amplitude. So if we take those two numbers and we do the 60 milliamps divided by 168 microamps, you get a forward current gain, or an HFE, of 357. So it's a very easy division math problem. It's very easy to do. You can take any one, in theory, you should be able to take any one of these and divide it out and you would get approximately the same gain okay but they can vary a little bit so if you look at this one it's kinda of hard to see on the printout but this one is 20 milliamps and we're on the third step so you have 48 microamps so you could take the 20 I didn't bring a calculator <laughs> so if I go 20 milliamps divided by the 48 microamps, right? And your gain is 416. So you can see the gain is a little bit, it changes a little bit based on your current or your uh, base current. Um, so to match a set of transistors, it's actually simpler than it looks. All you're going to do is you're going to attach your first transistor, and you're going to very carefully plot these curves where they are visually. What they, you know, pick a couple of them and see where they fall. Then put your next transistor in, and if these match, then the transistors theoretically match. So enough of, of this. Let's actually look at this in action, and take a look. So let me get a transistor put on here first. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect the elements. So you have emitter, base, and collector. Make sure you know the pinout of your transistor because unlike those little all-in-one test devices, these have to be connected correctly. If you mix up the elements, you can and most likely will damage or destroy the transistor. These are these do not have protection circuits in them. So it's assuming that you are going to connect them properly. And if you connect one of these transistors backwards, or you have a switch setting wrong, you have it a small transistor and you have it set to power transistor mode, or you have an NPN transistor and you're actually connecting a PNP, as soon as you flip that switch to turn it on, there's a good chance you will damage that transistor. 
So make double check your work when you at least with this particular unit and a lot of the curve tracers are like that. Now transistors are very susceptible to noise and heat and all kinds of things so when you connect it get your hands away from it just kind of let it hang in open air and we can flip this on and if you look there's your curves and you can see our curves there now this oscilloscope um, because of the amount of noise and so forth in this signal it gets all those little dots you will actually see that it's very noisy if you use an analog old school oscilloscope in XY mode um, believe it or not it actually looks really really good but these digital scopes this signal wreaks havoc on these digital uh, sampled scopes even this one I mean this is a, a very high-end oscilloscope it's expensive and it doesn't matter <laughs> uh, a lot of them will get this some of them won't just depends on the scope and the bandwidth and all kinds of things but this is about as clean as you're gonna get it but you can see the strut you can see the uh, the outputs pretty clearly you can see each curve and you can go in and you can count those so if we take a look here uh, here's your zero line here's your 168 uh, micro amperes for base current and if we look we're at 10 millivolts per division so we have 10 20 we have 30 millivolts so if we take our 30 millivolts and we divide it by our 168 microvolt <laughs> millivolts milliamps sorry guys doing this all live I'm not gonna edit it I'm just gonna so 20 or 30 millivolts divided by 168 microvolts your gain is 178 so there's your gain at that at that voltage level now let's take this transistor out okay take a good look at the picture there and let's swap out a different transistor okay I now have another transistor remember now uh, just I didn't mention but these are all 2N3904 transistors they're just standard garden variety NPN sig small signal transistors 2N3904s okay so remember that last one it that 168 was up to here so let's take a look now and as you can see this one has a lot more gain um, we have 10 20 30 40 50 and we're looking at about 55 let's say 55 uh, millivolts which equals 55 milliamps and if we take our 55 and we divide that by our 168 microvolts or microamps this one has a gain of 327 all right so and again I didn't do a super super accurate job of measuring and you can see just in the time I've had this on this has creeped up a little bit as the transistor came to its equilibrium of temperature so you notice this is drifting up and you can see we started out down here it's now drifted a little bit so it's actually a little higher than that so now you're looking somewhere between 330 and 350 is your gain of that transistor now just for just for kicks let's connect our peak uh, tester and take a look at what it says I now have the same exact transistor I took it off of the curve tracer and I placed it in the peak Atlas unit and we turn it on and you can see 345 so it's very close very close to what we were reading on our curve tracer and again this one was testing at 2.5 milliamps of current as opposed to we were looking at 30 <laughs> on ours there's your VBE there's your base current 
and there's your leakage current. So even though they're different devices, they kind of do correlate with one another as far as the gain is concerned, but again, it's not giving you every, you know, every condition. So that's kind of comparing those a little bit. Now what I'm going to show you now is something that I've been using for a while now and I kind of it's starting to become my preferred method for at least for these types of transistors for this type of application uh, my preferred way of matching up these small signal transistors so let me get it set up all right so here's a little device I can kind of put together quickly <laughs> on some proto board and this does not test the transistors in the same manner that those other two devices do. This one is measuring the transistor based on its VBE. So there's VBE testing and then there's HFE testing and they're different methods of testing a transistor. And there's all kinds of debate out there which ones are more relevant um, to the application that you're using it on and I'm not going to get into that because I don't even, I, I'll admit, I'm, I'm nowhere near uh, smart enough on the transistors <laughs> to be able to make an opinion on that. I can only go by my own experience and what, you know, what I've found has worked for me. Um, so again, any of you who, you know, are really knowledgeable in transistor theory, uh, especially how they, you know, they function at a very low level, I'd really appreciate it on the uh, on down on the comments section to you know let me know your thoughts because there's you know I'm always I want to learn more and more about this because I'm really interested in it and I'm sure some of you out there are as well. So here's this little device and it's it's a little bit of a variation on a circuit that has been floating around out there for a while. Uh, there's a really simple VBE matching device out there that I kind of I did a couple videos earlier on it you know when I first started messing around with them and uh, it looked promising and then I kind of went from there and I tried a few other things and this is where I ended up so what we're doing is we're going to apply an AC signal to our little VBE matching circuit and we're gonna actually look we're, we're going to not measure one transistor, but we're actually going to compare differences between two transistors. So I'm not really going to measure the forward current gain or any kind of things like that on the, this transistor. I'm only going to compare the VBEs and the turn on and turn off of these transistors under a re real world signal. So I'm applying a 60 Hertz because in America our line frequency is 60 Hertz. This would also work with 50 Hertz. This is a very forgiving circuit and there's lots of things. We'll talk about the circuit later but there's a lot of things that you know you can have some variations of and it'll still work. So let's uh, let's put our transistors in. Okay so I have two 2N3904s once again and I'm just plugging them into the two test sockets if I can see them because you know I'm blind <laughs> need some new bifocals and uh, that's it and what I'm going to do is we're going to go over to the oscilloscope here and let's uh, uh, get you centered a little bit and then we'll just plug the device in and there you go now right now I have this signal set to we're looking at 50 millivolts per division for right now and what you're looking at is the turn on and turn on pulses of the two transistors the, the difference as they gate on and off and then as they're as they're turned on the the difference while they're both turned on okay now because we're at 50 millivolts per division you're not going to read any really really minute differences in the, the VBEs you would have to increase and we can do that 
and I'm just looking at one millisecond per division for my scope just so I can get one cycle. If I shrink that down, or if I uh, speed up my sweep, which I'll do, um, wait a minute, I don't like using these touchpad things. I can tell you that right now. Ah. All right, hold on. There. Now you can see that I have, now you're seeing multiple pulses here. And you can see right here where the transistor is act two transistors are active and they're not active here and I'll show you why in a minute so let's open this waveform back up a little bit I just want to kinda there now what we're looking at right now is one complete cycle and I'm gonna turn on another we're gonna look at another channel now Okay, so what we're looking at right now is the, hold on a second, it would help if I got it right. Okay, what we're looking right now is the actual signal of the transistor, and we're looking at the AC coming out of that transformer that's going into the circuit. Sorry about that. So you can see as this, as the amplitude starts to go, it starts to climb. Okay, and we're, I just have everything inverted right now because of the way the tester works. You can see this thing rapidly will switch. And then you'll see its active region. And then as it goes through its zero crossing again, it shuts down. And you can kind of see where, you know, where the transistors kind of collapse a little bit, your rise time and fall time. Then while we're in the other half cycle, the, that's not in phase with the transistor, you can kind of see it's just turned off right there. You're, there is a little bit noise. This is a, a inexpensive uh, PC-based oscilloscope, so it does get a little bit of background noise. It's just kind of the way it works. So... Now here's the thing. This is a pretty well matched pair of transistors. And I'm going to do a couple demonstrations to show you how this works. I'm, first of all, I'm going to get rid of this purple because we don't need it. It's just there to kind of show you what's going on in the background. And so I'm going to back out here. And I'm going to come down here. Let's move this all up. And I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is try to get you as big of an image as I can and stay in frame. I'm going to just touch one of these transistors with my finger and heat it up. In other words, right now they're both pretty much at the same ambient temperature. But let's see what happens if I, throw, if I heat one up. What's going on? Can you see that? Let's let it go. And let me just take a little, and you can see the transistors are no longer matched. Because, of course, one has a different, you know, temper. Again, transistors drift with temperature. So I'm simulating a mismatched pair. If I take this little piece of plastic and I fan them, and I end up bringing the with ambient air, and I bring them back to equilibrium, you'll see they balance back out pretty good. Now, once again, these are a couple of 2N3904s, and they, they're a pair that came, I, I ordered a whole batch of them from China at one time, and these are, I believe, are fake 2N3904s. They're knockoffs. Um, 
I, you know, where these are the kind that you buy a, a bag of 50 of them or a bag of 100 of them for a couple of dollars <laughs> on eBay. But let me get a genuine uh, 2N3904. So those transistors look like this. And you can see they have very short, thin legs on them. And they don't really have any kind of a you know, a manufacturer's maker mark on them or anything. And if we look at this one, for instance, it has thicker, nicer leads on it and better formed casing. And it has the little symbol of Fairchild Electronics. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a Fairchild. It's a real one that was ordered from a domestic supplier. I think these came from, this one may have come from Mauser or DigiKey or somebody. So let's take one of these transistors out and let's put this one in its place. What happened? Crazy, huh? What you're looking at now is a set of transistors whose characteristics do not match. This is an unmatched pair. Now, again, if I just go by the part number, they're both 2N3904s. And I, this is an extreme example here of two transistors that are nowhere near the same as one another, even though they're both 2N3904s. This is why you can't just buy a couple of transistors with the same number on them and whack them in there and not worry about it, because it's very possible that even though they're both you know, you know, you hear a lot of things out there, comments about, for instance, NTE. You know, NTEs don't work. NTEs are junk. Well, that's partial. That is not totally true. A lot of the NTE components are not junk. It's just that they are not an exact duplicate of what it replaces. NTE has a habit of taking one device and calling it a substitute for multiple different devices simply because the actual voltage and current handling and, and frequency capabilities of the transistor are similar or very close. So in many instances that will be a good substitute but in this kind of instance where they have to be very matched this would not work <laughs> obviously. Now let's take it. Let's take the uh, the one that matches and put it back in again. There we go. Plug this back in, and it settles right down. Now, if they were totally perfectly matched these little bumps would almost totally flatten out. It's very, very hard to find a pair of transistors that match that closely. But um, in general, if, if the amplitude of these peaks are not real high and they're somewhat symmetrical and in its operation zone here, it's not... If you noticed when we had the incorrect transistor in there, this line was not at zero. It was really grossly floating off center. Those are all telltale signs that the transistors don't work, don't play well together. <laughs> so, th and again, this is just something that I've been experimenting with. Um, I, I've not really read about this, doing this anywhere else. Uh, and I, I'm not claiming I invented anything because I, I really don't know. It's just something I tried. Um, I obviously did not come up with the idea of this uh, VBE matching circuit, you know, minus the transformer because it's been around for a long time and there's a lot of different uh, variations of it out there. Um, but this is a very simple device that seems to work very well. And I've compared my results with this with my curve tracer and with my Peak Atlas and they, it seems to correlate with them. So, uh, but more importantly, 
I can leave because this is putting such low signal on the transistors I can leave this on for a very extended period of time and I can test these transistors um, over time uh, I can also look at their thermal characteristics because if the transistors if I heat both the transistors up equally they should they should still stay nulled out pretty well um, but some of them will react grossly different from the others and that's another thing you kind of want to see so if you're checking thermal stability and so forth so this this is what I've been using lately and I just wanted to share it with you um, it seems to work for me but I'd love to know your thoughts on it what you all think about it and uh, so I thought I'd put this video together because I'm I'm actually testing out some transistors today to get ready to rebuild this uh, phono stage and I needed those so uh, there you go and now before we look at the uh, before we look at the circuit itself I want to put a set of PNP transistors in because I want to show something to you alright so I now just have a pair of 2N3906 which are the kind of the complements to 2N3904's they're just their PNP instead of NPN and I just kinda of want to demonstrate how this thing works if I move down here all I need to do is take these out and just plug I don't have to change anything or switch anything this circuit works with both PNP and NPN I can stick this in here like this can reach it and you can see right there immediately it works on the NPNs as well now this would be a pair that are not very close super perfectly matched because now remember we were looking at this side for the NPN now as I told you we're working on the other direction so if I uh, if I hook the scope probe real quick on the purple you know on the uh, other channel you can see we're now working on the other half waveform or half cycle I should say and uh, you can see how during operation there is a VBE mismatch between the two transistors a little bit and you can see those spikes are not real symmetrical either you know you see the one here on the one side and you see this one on the other side so these transistors, this is a pair of transistors that, that to me would not, that are not very well matched. So again, this thing can check NPN and PNP. It compares them very, very quickly, and it seems to be very accurate. Um, so there you go. That's kind of a demonstration of how this little thing works. Let's take a look at the schematic now. So as you can see here, the circuit for this thing, I just kind of drew this out freehand real quick. <laughs> the circuit is very simple. Um, these little square things just rep represent the sockets that you would plug the transistors into. And what I used on the device, as you can see, are just a couple of these little um, IC sockets. They're just, uh, well, let's see. I don't have one handy, but they're just regular 8-pin uh, dip in IC sockets. And uh, you can do NPN or PNP. It doesn't matter what you plugged in the socket. The only thing is you have to have the elements in this order. The collector always has to be connected to this pin. The base always has to be collected to this pin. And the emitter has to always be collected to, connected to this pin. So... Now, if we look up here, we just have a basic transformer, and this is a, in this one, I just, all, it's what I had, it's a 12.6 volt center tapped transformer from Radio Shack, it's just an old one I bought at Radio Shack when they were closing. Um, the center tap of the transformer goes to the bases of the two transistors, and to the junc junction point of these two diodes. Now these diodes are really just voltage limiting. So we have a 3.3K resistor on one side 
of our input on the on the collector side and this is for again for current limiting and so forth and then we have these two back-to-back -back 1N4148s that no matter which polarity we have you know positive or negative voltage up here one of them's always going to shunt to ground through this resistor and it's going to clip the voltage off at the forward voltage drop of the, the diode so it's going to limit your voltage up here to somewhere around point anywhere from 0.5 to 0.7 volts um, and all that's going to do is ensure that you have your somewhere around 0.1 ma or milliamp of current flowing through here and it's just a current limiting circuit you can take this out it will increase the voltage here and it will work at a little higher voltage here and it works the circuit still works so uh, you know it, it doesn't it'll work either way but if you want some extra you know, especially with really small sensitive transistors I kinda like using the smaller signal you really don't want a whole lot of voltage on the collector for this test um, now the emitters the outputs of the emitters are tied together to one another through a couple of 100 K resistors and I just realized that I drew my schematic incorrectly so ignore this and ignore this these actually should be here and here and my apologies when in doubt white it out there you go so uh, anyways so that's a little more like it <laughs> there you go good as new okay so anyways um, so if you look here we have um, our 100k resistors so you can see this is a very high and pretty high impedance circuit anyways somewhat high and they're tied together through this 500 ohm 20 turn trimmer pot and the reason that we did that was so that this has to be very accurate the VBE on a transistor is very very small on these and tiny little differences in VBE can be big differences in the matching of the transistors so that's why if there's any error in other words if these are not exactly 100,000 ohms each that error will show up in your test results so all this pot does is it nulls out any differences between these and the way to the way to calibrate it is you would just short this pin to this pin and this pin to this pin you would disconnect this transformer and then you'd put your your voltage between here and here and then it would make a voltage divider and you would measure between here and here and theoretically uh, I'm sorry you would measure down here and theoretically if there were any difference between the two voltages down here um, it would be you you would null it out with this pot that's all you're gonna do so you just you're using this to null out the difference between these that's it so there you have it anyways it's a very simple circuit and by applying this AC the nice thing is it's AC voltage so every half cycle the polarity reverses and that's why this will work on NPN or PNP it doesn't care either way it works so there you go um, if any of you are interested at all in this and you're not asleep and bored by now um, if you want to email me uh, for more information or if you want a copy of this or whatever or you want to ask some questions uh, just feel free to shoot me an email that's okay it's on you know it's on the bottom of the the video description on you know above the comments section of the video so uh, I just thought you might be interested in that uh, if you're into this kind of thing and uh, 
so for right now that's about it so I'm gonna get back to work and uh, get me some transistors matched up and get this thing rebuilt and uh, move on from there so I appreciate all of you thank you all for your nice comments and so forth and uh, as always peace joy happiness and good health in your lives I wish you all the best and until next time stay well bye bye